you could find billions for war, find billions for peace and justice. That's what is more. Ar arithmetic was never John's strong point. He hasn't you heard. Sacked, he he hasn't. He hasn't. I resign. I resign, John. You are very unlikely ever to get a job, aren't you? But let's let's just uh, let's just put a little fact in front of him because he always finds them embarrassing. The war cost 1.5 billion, and the contributions from overseas are 1.4 billion. So all these billions that are being spent on war only exist in your overfevered imagination. The hospital wars. The hospital wars. Tell us about the hospital no, I, I, wars. I, I, we I, keep I, them open. Well, well let, I'll come we, back to we, you. We have a health service on which we're we have a health service on which we're spending more money than any Labour government ever dreamt of spending. And yeah, it's time, that. John, you allowed your prejudices to yeah. take a back seat and looked at a few facts occasionally, no, if you could understand. No wonder you got sacked. <laughs> I didn't get sacked. <laughs> Tabloid business is a dying industry. They sell 10 million, a million less papers than they did 10 years ago. The Daily Mirror is dying even faster than other papers. It's 24% down on you, sales. You're dying on your ago. feet, mate. I'd back in if I were you. <laughs> they have tried to. Newspapers have tried. The tabloids have tried to blame the Queen for the Queen bur the poor Borough fiasco, and it was clearly. Sorry, a David, I've heard enough of this rubbish. Listen. Well, why don't you leave the room? Well, I'll tell you what I'd love. <laughs> I never leave my adoring fans. When you made the decision that it was right to be non-unilateralist, having been unilateralist all these years, when you made the decision to be a good European, having not been a good European, when you made the decision to give up nationalising, having always been a nationaliser, when you made the decision to do devolution for Scotland, having always been against it, was that on high moral grounds? <laughs> or was it because you wanted the votes? And I'm surprised to find how much I'm in agreement with Arthur Scargill. He is a genuine old socialist. He knows knows what a socialist is. You don't know what a socialist is. Let him answer you. I don't know why I've provoked so much aggression on behalf of a liberal, a liberal peeress, but let me deal with Not two a of peer, the points. Not a a woman peer. All oh, right, a woman peer. Uh, we will deal with two of the points of alleged inconsistency which were alleged at me. Apparently, I've been anti-devolution and have suddenly become devolution. Well, your party has. I was actually the minister who carried through the devolution legislation in the last Labour government. You have your I was supposed to. What would you allow me to answer, please? <laughs> You're not in the House of Lords now. You're in a place where you have to listen to other people. Speaking as uh, Vice Chairman of Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge, and also currently as a uh, wife of the hospital orderly at uh, North Sea Camp Prison. <laughs> I think I see the health service in the round. Oh, yes, the of need... course, those two examples. <laughs> <laughs> the need for... Yeah, I'll cover it. The uh, need for... I find it quite extraordinary that politician Mr Heath's experience should be so ready to find life with Saddam Hussein tolerable. I'm not saying that for one moment. Having read, uh, having met uh, President Saddam Hussein, which you haven't done, I know perfectly... <laughs> I know... Uh, perfectly well what he's like. All you've done is sit in uh, your office and demand a war every day since August the 2nd. <laughs> what do you believe, course, what do you course, believe let me finish. Of course, has taught I, you about him that the rest of us don't know. A great deal. And it really is disgraceful you should make such an accusation in public like this. It's true. You're taking it down to 14, and that would really worry me. I'd be firmer on 18 and leave it there. When I listen to Geoffrey preaching the eternal compromise of 18, yes, I think of the remark that I make to my students. Why do Englishmen like sitting on the fence so much? Because they enjoy the sensation. <laughs> there, is, there is no ground 
that's in reason or logic or justice for 18... I enjoyed the very clever way you got a laugh, uh, David. Uh, I'm bound to say to you, I was not sitting on the fence and I was not compromising. 18 is what I feel and 18 is what I believe. And you don't have the right to doubt my beliefs and think just because you're an expert in this subject, I don't have the right to say what I feel or get a cheap laugh out of it. I stand by 18 and I mean it. What he is saying to me is that I would have been right to have stayed and spoken in favour of policies coming out of Europe, destroying NATO, massive nationalisation, destruction of any private education, any private health service, moving towards a semi-East European state. That would have been all right within the tabernacle of the Labour Party. I mean, I'll be blunt with you, Roy. You talk about cancer. I feel very strongly about people whose entire life depends on the working class movement. Your father was a miner, he was in jail in the general strike, you got into parliament as a Labour member, every office you held was because of the Labour Party, cabinet minister, appointed by a Labour prime minister, and then you left the party. Now that's a cancerous growth, not personally, but I think people who betray those who gave them power are the real threat, and I must say that bluntly to you because I think that means Having said that, having said that, you think you're promising us Derek Hatton being leader of the Labour Party? I'm not. I'm only saying, Roy. I'm only saying, Roy, that the people that stay true to those who put them in power, these are the people I admire, not the people who climb into power on the backs of others, kick away the ladder, and are presented by everybody as men of principle and moderate. Why is it always millionaires like years. yourself get uptight about two pound an hour for people on minimum wage? Well, Why do you always have to you. do that? I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Because I know something about actually creating jobs as opposed to just talking well, about them. You've it. obviously you done did. a lot better than yeah. your work is. Yes. Yeah, but in fact created a large number of jobs in the process. Not at two pound really. an hour. Now you just tell the people is in this country... Is two pound an you, hour acceptable yeah, to you? You know perfectly well that what you're talking about is four pounds and eight p an hour is, as a minimum is wage. Is two That's pound an it, hour acceptable it, it, to it, you as a people, very wealthy man? It is nothing to do with me being a wealthy man. Well, what you're trying is it to, acceptable what two what, pound an what, hour? It is entirely a matter of what people are prepared to accept in the circumstances oh. of getting a job.